Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to my talk today on function and metaphor. I have a long-term interest in formulating alternative foundations for criticism and medium analysis of functional ceramics. And today, I'm going to present some ideas I've been working through for the past few years. To be a bit more specific about what I mean, when I say alternative, I mean alternative to mainstream contemporary fine art criticism. When I talk about criticism, uh, what I mean is talking about specific works uh, in, in some particular medium. And then when I talk about medium analysis, uh, I'm talking about elucidating the characteristic expressive mechanisms of, uh, let's say, functional ceramics um, at some level, talking about the kind of grammar of pots. Um, I'm mainly going to spend my time presenting examples of the critical approach I'm advocating. But I did want to mention up front that the approach is inspired largely by the writings of Suzanne Langer and Nelson Goodman, and by an insightful analysis of metaphor by Julian Jaynes. Metaphor is really the concept that ties the approach together. If we can analyze a strong metaphoric structure in the critique of an individual piece, we may be able to extrapolate and articulate something more general about the medium of functional ceramics as a whole. We'll need to expand a bit on the usual notion of metaphor as a purely linguistic or literary trope, but I hope you'll find that this broadening of the concept meshes nicely with the intuitive way we think about the character of a really strong pot. So here we have two guinomi, um, small drinking vessels meant for sake, uh, on the left by Goro Suzuki and on the right by Ichiro Hori. Both are designated by their makers as being of the traditional Japanese pottery style called kiseto. Already at the level of sheer appearance, a difference in the degree of formality jumps out at you, with the Suzuki piece taking a relaxed, mildly distorted form, while the Hori piece has a relatively stiff, symmetric, precisely lobed form. The color tones as well are warmer and more kind of savory in the Suzuki piece on the left while the hori piece is much cooler, especially with the ra rather stark um, ashen grays. But the primary axis of contrast between these two guinomi really becomes clear when you handle and drink from them for a while. After exploring different ways of holding each of them, I found myself gravitating towards uh, the hand positions shown here, largely I think because of the differences in size and weight, with the Suzuki piece being much heftier than it looks with a lot of weight in its base, and um, because of the averted flare of the hori, and therefore kind of how you have to handle it in order to drink from it comfortably. So synthesizing the visual and the haptic impressions using the Suzuki Goinomi on the left is um, kind of like hugging a drinking buddy at a bar, while using the hori is maybe more like um, a ballroom dance with your venerable great aunt. Both experiences worth having certainly, but um, quite different in overall feeling. And it's that overall feeling, isn't it, that, um, that embodies the character of each piece with the strength of character somehow related to the degree of synergy and cohesion among a piece's various formal traits, color, shape, heft, texture, etc. In this talk, I want to argue that this kind of character and synergy can be analyzed as a type of metaphor. And more specifically, I'd like to examine some ways in which functional aspects of ceramic vessels can play an important role in establishing such metaphor which following the ideas of aesthetic philosophers like Langer and Goodman, I want to say represents a pot's meaning as an artwork. Goodman writes that uh, metaphor happens when we apply a label to an object outside its proper realm. So uh, in the case of the guinomi we just looked at, the labels that we're applying in this metaphor would be that the Suzuki guinomi on the left was sort of affable maybe, and the hori guinomi on the right was a bit more aloof. Goodman furthermore writes that uh, metaphor is most potent when the transferred schema um, exists uh, or affects a new and notable organization rather than a mere relabeling of an old one, where an unaccustomed organization results, new associations and discriminations are also made within the realm of transfer. And the metaphor is the more telling as these are the more intriguing and significant. And I think this line of reasoning um, points the way to use utilizing metaphor, not only as a basis for the critique of individual works, but also for developing a broader platform of medium analysis for functional ceramics. So to develop our example a bit further, let's look at some more functional work to explore how natural it might be to generalize the metaphoric labeling prompted by our consideration of user experience with the Kisito Grinomi. 
So um, here on the left, we have a, uh, a Hikidashi Black uh, Yunomi, uh, again by Ichiro Hori. And on the right, um, there's a Seihakuji, uh, so a, a blue celadon on porcelain Yunomi by uh, Tsubusa Kato. And the question at hand is whether there's a natural sense in which we can place these objects on a spectrum from affable on one end to aloof on the other, as suggested by uh, our prior analysis. Now, if we just look at the empty Unomi, the general impressions I get are of a surface that's kind of like tar or maybe like crocodile skin uh, in the, with the uh, Hori Unomi on the left versus something more like blue sky or ice uh, for the Kato Unomi on the right. Uh, with, with neither one really seeming particularly intimate at first glance. But of course, when we actually use them for drinking steeped tea, we discover some different views and, and we need to hold them in particular ways that, that change as their temperature goes from initially being quite hot uh, to eventually being sort of lukewarm. So just thinking about how things look when we actually have tea in the vessels. Uh, so with the Kato, uh, the Celadon porcelain Yunomi on the right, you know, the stronger color of the tea as compared to the ceramic surface really serves to emphasize the kind of independent substance of the tea as something contained within the Yunomi and served up by it. At the same time, the way the blue of the celadon diffuses into the tint of the tea, looking at the inside bottom surface, reminds me somehow of a Rothko painting, maybe, and it projects really a serene, elegant, and refined sort of mood, I think. With the Hori uh, you, know, you know me on the left, on the other hand, this view into the deep dark interior makes the tea itself seem colorless and the ceramic surface almost merges with the contents as if the liquid you're drinking is the Yunomi itself. The extremely subdued color contrast projects um, a meditative sort of mood and uh, the elusive impression of something obscure underneath the liquid kind of pulls your attention in to its ambiguous depth. When we're holding these pieces as they're still really hot when they've first been filled with the hot tea, uh, for the Kato Yunomi on the right, so I think you can see in this image, so the rim is extremely sharp, very vertical, and then there's quite a tall and, and substantial foot. Um, so really the top rim where your thumb naturally sits and, and the foot of it, uh, they both uh, remain quite cool, even when the central part of the, of the Yunomi is really quite hot. And so there's a funny sort of sense where as you're holding it, you really kind of get the sense that this is a piece that wants to be held without really being touched. Uh, the, the Hori piece on the other hand on the left, uh, it has a nice softly rounded sort of lip uh, with convenient indentations all around for your thumb to sit in. And when you actually take a sip, your lip encounters this almost wrinkly kind of surface with a very organic texture. As the tea cools off and uh, you kind of uh, find yourself wanting to really hold the piece in a closer way. This uh, Kato piece on the right, um, the glaze on the outside is really, it's a very smooth, very glassy, kind of impermeable feeling surface. Like if your hand is a little bit sweaty, it's actually quite slippery to hold this thing. Um, and you get this feeling again, that it's kind of, it's uh, not even really letting you touch its real skin. It's almost like you're touching this sort of glassy force field around it. So, you know, overall, the impression that you get out of all this is of a, of a rather kind of cold, refined, almost intellectual sort of beauty of the overall piece, uh, maybe an, an alien sort of beauty with some sort of hidden, unknowable internality, You're kind of like a glacier. For the Hori piece on the left, though, as you really grab it, it has the feel of like a, a smooth bark uh, kind of tree branch, and it offers a, a rustic sort of comfort in its warmth. Um, I think it has the beauty of worn age and the piece as a whole through its visuals and, and its texture really kind of invites you in and you have this feeling that it's kind of merging with your hand. And that all continues the, the initial visual impression of a, a warm sort of darkness that you can just melt into. So coming back to this idea that the apprehension of metaphor and concomitant application of imported labels to individual pots can trigger the recognition of new ways of organizing the realm of functional ceramics as a whole, perhaps we could say that these examples we've considered show that um, the interplay of surface color and texture, heft, and the consequences of form for manner of use enable some pots to bring you close while others uh, keep you at a distance.
And so rather than this being a statement about a specific individual pot, this is now something that we can try to hold up as a characteristic feature of functional ceramics as, as an artistic genre. So uh, now I'd like to spend some time illustrating a somewhat more technical level of analysis of metaphor due to Jillian Jane's, um, first in Jane's own words, and then with some examples from functional ceramics. Jane asks in this quote at the top of the slide, but what are we really trying to do when we try to understand anything? Like children trying to describe nonsense objects, so in trying to understand a thing, we are trying to find a metaphor for that thing. Which is to say that basically what we're doing so far in like say this lecture is we're trying to elucidate or understand some thoughts and it's a natural thing to do that by uh, means of some sort of metaphor. Now James introduces in his book some rather technical terms uh, regarding metaphor, uh, the metaphors of the metafrand and the corresponding parafires and parafrand, but rather than trying to define these I think it's easier just to review a very nice example that James offers in his book. So this longer quote just under the image there uh, from page 57 of uh, Origin of Consciousness, Jane says, consider the metaphor that the snow blankets the ground. The metaphrand is something about the completeness and even thickness with which the ground is covered by snow. The metafier is a blanket on a bed. Right, so, so the metafrand is the thing that we're trying to describe by means of metaphor. And metafiers are sort of like the, the elements of, of, that, of the structure of that metaphor. So the, the metaphor here is a blanket on a bed, but the pleasing nuances of this metaphor are in the parifiers of the metaphor blanket. These are something about warmth, protection, and slumber until some period of awakening. These associations of blanket then automatically become the associations or parifrands of the original metaphrand, the way the snow covers the ground. And we thus have created by this metaphor, the idea of the earth sleeping and protected by the snow cover until its awakening in spring. All this is packed into the simple use of the word blanket to pertain to the way the snow covers the ground. Right, so I think it's worth even just reading through this example a second time, uh, now that uh, the, the, the strangeness of the terminology is maybe a little reduced. Consider the metaphor that the snow blankets the ground. The metaphrand is something about the completeness and even thickness with which the ground is covered by snow. The metaphor is a blanket on a bed. But the pleasing nuances of this metaphor are in the parifiers of the metaphor blanket. These are something about warmth, protection, and slumber until some period of awakening. These associations of blanket then automatically become the associations or parifrands of the original metaphor, the way the snow covers the ground. And thus, we have created by this metaphor the idea of the earth sleeping and protected by the snow cover until its awakening in spring. Um, and just before we move on, I just want to offer that if anybody in the audience can recognize the view shown in this photo on this slide, I'll buy them a beard and seek an extra in Sacramento. Okay, so uh, to try to illustrate the idea of these, you know, uh, metafires and parifiers and all that kind of thing, I wanted to revisit an example um, that I used in my NSEQ lecture in 2018. Uh, but, uh, you know, here I'm going to talk about it in the context of this uh, discussion of the structure of metaphor. First, I just uh, you know, want to talk about this piece kind of informally, and, and then I'll have a summary slide where I, I relate all of it back to the, the technical analysis um, of Jane's. So this piece is a, a sake pourer, something like a karakuchi, if you're familiar with that terminology. And it's shown here in several different views. And I think especially in the top view that's down here in the bottom center of the slide, you can kind of imagine the natural way it feels like it wants to be picked up is if you kind of were to take your right hand and put your thumb there and kind of wrap your hand around it with the, the knuckles of your hand kind of lining up with these corners, um, there's that natural kind of way of trying to pick it up from the back. And uh, there are these little slots or grooves or um, shavings into the side of the piece that again, you know, provide some natural little finger holds um, that you know, your, your hand will kind of naturally adjust to. Uh, it's a little bit unusual in its aspect ratio. You know, it's somewhat narrow in one direction and it's quite deep. Um, and it's a, it's a really lovely piece to use. Uh, although I'll kind of comment that the spout is a little bit dribbly. And, you know, at the same time that there are some um, very uh, convenient functionalities of it, that's also, I mean, it's a piece of a lot of character. Like it's not trying to be perfect in any way. 
And it certainly is asserting something that I think is worth trying to, to dig in and analyze. One of the first associations I had when starting to think more carefully about this piece, in this top view, I was kind of struck by the way in which the geometry of it, there's certainly an angular and rectilinear kind of aspect to it. But at the same time, there's something about it that feels curved. And it's sort of odd the way that it curves into this point, uh, sort of where the, the spout is. And I was really reminded of this, um, this uh, structure that's pictured on this slide. It's the chapel of the Notre Dame du Haut uh, by Le Corbusier. Um, and you know, some of the things that, uh, you know, this peak in the roof or something that I kind of associate with this curvy pointy shape. And also, you know, the, the chapel has these funny kind of square cutout windows um, that uh, remind me of these, these cutouts that are here for some obscure reason in the upper parts of this, uh, of this sake pour. Now, if you look at an image taken inside this chapel of the Notre Dame du Haut, you can see that these, um, these cuts through the, wind, uh, through the walls, which are really quite thick walls, and these kind of unusual square unframed shapes, um, at least of, for the ones that are kind of high up in the wall, those are placed and in, in, uh, in cut in such a way that those are clearly not so that people who are inside the chapel can see out. Um, but rather, especially these high windows, those are there to let light into the space in a very particular kind of way. You know, I'm reminded again by, you know, this aspect ratio of the piece where it's sort of narrow in one direction, in one dimension, long in the other, and, and rather tall. It has the dimensions kind of, of like a box canyon. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've ever had this experience going hiking. Um, certainly, this is something you can find in Southern California, where I spent many years that uh, you'll find these box canyons that may have, uh, have uh, waterfalls or, or filled with water at certain times of year. And so you kind of think of them as these um, refreshing oasis that you uh, may come across in, during, on a hot day of hiking and you kind of wade in there. It has a very cool, refreshing feeling. And so that you know, ties into some more uh, tactile or functional features of a piece like this that um, you know, with a sake pour, if you're drinking cold sake and you fill it up reasonably high, you maybe halfway up to the spout, you know, that will, that, that'll be enough cold liquid to really cool off the outside of the piece, which will then condense a little bit of dew. So, you know, as you're placing your whole hand around this piece to pick it up in the natural way that it wants to be held, there's a real coolness that hits your hand, a little bit of dampness. But then if the fill line is somewhere reasonable, there's sort of a transition between coolness at the bottom of the piece and the sort of more ambient temperature at the top that kind of rests in the middle of your palm. So you become very aware of that kind of finite fill of the piece and the idea of a, of a vessel that um, is uh, kind of filled with a, a precious, precious coolness. And, you know, this whole association with canyons also, you know, I think it provides another perspective on, on thinking of the, the, uh, the buildup on the surface from uh, ash on this kind of a wood fired piece, the, the flashing effects. You know, they remind me again of sort of things that you see in canyons. And you know, I was uh, reminded of a, a quote attributed to Robert Turner um, in the book on Robert Turner by Marsha Miro. So this is Robert Turner, Turner um, speaking of Canyon de Chez. Uh, Turner says, when you touch the rock, the walls have very soft curves in the body, and then there are sudden cuts, the results of events that occurred. Other canyons like Hovenweep, where rock formations were used by the Native Americans as habitations, structures will, were built here using the formations of the earth and rock, significant structures like Pueblo type buildings and ceremonial structures and secret places for religious ceremonies. They are beautiful containers of space. And so you know, that again gives you another way to think about these kind of little cutouts uh, or these sort of shaved ridges and things that are in the side walls. They're like these sudden cuts that um, Turner talks about um, in, in geological terms. And then you know, this invocation of the idea of um, ceremonial structures for religious ceremonies you know, this uh, aspect ratio, again, kind of combined with these small cutouts at the top. I think that really, for me, invokes the idea of a, of a kiva, if you've come across this uh, term. Um, so these are, are structures found in the American Southwest. And, the, and these were structures used for uh, religious ceremonies. But, you know, I often think of these images where it's sort of, there's a dark interior and just a, often a square opening that lets light in from the top. So I think, you know, pulling all these associations together. So we're approaching this new plot for the first time, trying to make some sense of it, trying to understand what its character is, what it's trying to say. And so what I've done in the past few slides kind of informally would be just to make an inventory 
of associations, almost free associations that, that arise when looking at um, various component features of the form of the piece. And so over here on the upper right of the slide, I'll just list some things like there's this angular yet curved and pointed plan. The surface is characterized by earth tones, earthy textures, ash strips. There are these kinds of sheet cuts that seem like they were taken maybe from the clay at a leather hard stage. There are these high geometric piercings of the wall, which you know don't have any evident uh, function, uh, function in the piece as a, as a pourer of liquid. Uh, in the shape of the piece, the way that it suggests that you handle it with your palm against the back and uh, you know the coolness of the fill line against your palm that you get um, because of that, uh, the dribbly spout, which kind of makes you think about rainwater trickling down the side of a canyon. So um, getting back to these technical terms and the kind of structural analysis that James is offering, the idea is to take all of these um, formal aspects that you note and then just try and you know, start uh, taking an inventory of what are the things that they make you think of. So I noted some things like this particular chapel, the Notre Dame du Haut, another kind of religious uh, ceremonial structure, the kiva, um, some maybe uh, more uh, naturally occurring kind of sacred spaces, box canyons, canyon de Chez. And so these would be the things that I think um, James is um, talking about as metafires, so kind of elements of the metaphor. And then, you know, each of these uh, elements has some kind of uh, feeling to it, right, that end up being projected into the piece. So with all these associations, there's a general theme that emerges or an idea of shelter or sanctuary, maybe of natural oasis or spiritual oasis, kind of an idea of interiority. And then when we add all of those, th those things together and try to synthesize something to, okay, so what does that all add up to, right? You know, what is the kind of meaning that emerges out of that? And I would, you know, to try to put it in words, I would say it's something like, um, uh, you know, this vessel really invites us to, to uh, dwell within its sacred interior space. And so here, you know, this kind of aggregate meaning uh, or this sort of new thing which is revealed by the metaphor about the pot um, or by this, this kind of articulated or structured metaphor, um, this is a thing that I, I believe James refers to as, as a paraphrase. So, you know, in that, that structure, this idea of there's an, uh, uh, sort of an inventory of things that a thing makes you think about, and these collectively start to build up with the meaning of the pieces. I did just want to mention in passing that I find this very resonant with ideas um, that are famously attributed to Martin Heidegger in uh, some of his later essays, like The Origin of the Work of Art and The Thing. Uh, and so, you know, uh, Heidegger talks about a, a verb of thinging, you know, which is sort of this way that a material object can cause you to kind of remember or recall or make associations with lots of other things from your lived experience. And that somehow the fact that all of these far-flung kinds of ideas are invoked by a single object, you know, your temptation is to really try to synthesize all, all that and say, well, how would all these two, how, how do all these things fit together? And in what way does then that reflect upon the object itself as sort of a, a meaning that that object is creating? Um, you know, so if we take as the, the, the kind of punchline of this metaphor for this uh, particular uh, sake pour, as, uh, as I've talked about it, the vessel invites us to dwell within its sacred interior space. I wanted to make another connection to ideas of these philosophers, Suzanne Langer and Nelson Goodman, um, where they talk about, um, you know, the, another aspect of this kind of meaning that an artwork uh, or that things can have as being what they call projectable symbolic revelation. Um, Goodman especially talks about this in one of his later books uh, titled Ways of Worldmaking. And so um, I you know, want to make this connection just briefly to the idea of uh, the virtual space of art or the plastic space of art. There's, for example, a, a fairly well-known essay by um, Pierre Frank Castel called uh, The Destruction of a Plastic Space, um, in, in which uh, Frank Castel talks about how developments in painting, uh, in uh, kind of modern painting, led to a breaking down of a, a, a very strong convention that had emerged in, in painting, where rather than in a traditional scene, you'd be looking at a painting as if you were looking at a window, right? And all the rules of perspective and these sorts of things as such. You can see in, you know, obviously in modern paintings, if we get to Mondrian or Cubism or things like that, that a lot of what's happening there is the whole uh, kind of convention and structure of space, of the virtual space created by um, a piece of art gets really deconstructed and kind of rebuilt in a new way. And just uh, tacking onto that, that sort of idea, um, 
I think what you can say is that this pouring vessel um, by Takahara really asserts a very complex sort of inside out plastic space uh, because of these multi-sensory and functional associations where you know you as the user of this piece are obviously outside of it and you're looking primarily at its exterior. But I think most of the things that it invokes through this, the kind of more metaphor of its appearance and its, its functional qualities, you know, they really draw your attention to the interiority of the piece, right? So there's some kind of manipulation of, of the of plastic space in this piece, which is, uh, you know, quite unusual compared to anything that you might think of um, seeing in uh, a sculpture or a painting. You know, that, that in terms, um, you know, I mentioned this idea of, of Langer and Goodman about um, uh, these kinds of ideas that are um, revealed to you by contemplating art objects, uh, that they're especially significant when they're projectable to a, a broader context. <clears throat> so, you know, I think um, having that realization about this particular um, sake pour, you know, it encourages you to go back and sort of think about the plastic space of other pots that you may have seen in your life, other memorable pots. So I, I really went back to thinking about Nazca ceramics that I've seen in museums. And I don't know if you've um, seen it, any of these yourself, but uh, you know, in pieces like the one that's shown on the left slide here, you know, there's this white ground and then a really very vivid, vivid kind of slip painting of these almost you know, very graphic, almost cartoon-like um, mystical or magical or, or divine creatures. Often they have this very dragon-like or snake-like appearance, and they're often curled around the outside of a pot like this. So if you think about this in terms of the implied virtual space or the kind of plastic space of this of this object, like with this um, divine creature kind of obviously wrapped around the exterior of the pot, what is that saying about what the space inside the pot is, what it might contain or, or how we're supposed to experience it or perceive it? And I, I think there's really something very interesting going on there vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, what might otherwise seem like a similar uh, kind of category of pots, let's say white ground lekithoi in um, classical attic pottery, where um, I'm no expert in this kind of thing, but I guess I've always perceived those more as being kind of like the sort of scene that you would see as a as on a flat wall as a mural, but now simply wrapped around this more cylindrical sort of piece. And I don't know that they typically have the same kind of uh, implied interior space, which is uh, like the Nazca piece that you, you have on the left. Um, so I just want to give one, one additional quick illustration of this kind of analysis in terms of uh, metafires and parafires and such. Um, and it's going to introduce the kind of uh, the metaphor that I'll, I'll carry through to the end of this talk. So this is another piece that I talked about in the 2018 NCCA presentation, but again, I want to kind of review it in terms of this um, this structure that's that's highlighted in the work of Julian Jaynes. Um, so this is another Guinomi by a Japanese potter named Sayaka Shingu, uh, and so uh, here's a close up of it. So you know the the features, the kinds of features that really popped out for me in looking at the piece and then using it. So. It has a very uh, crenellated sort of rim. You can see the lip is actually something that's rather complicated to navigate. Uh, and then the interior surface of the vessel um, has a fairly glossy kind of glaze applied to it, whereas the exterior has a um, very chalky sort of something that feels like an underglaze. Uh, um, and then structurally, it has some interesting features like on the underside of it. And you know, in this image on the left, you can see these black, this kind of cluster of needles sort of, and it kind of reminds you of a sea urchin or uh, maybe, you know, the maw of a lamprey eel or something like that. And, you know, overall, as you use it, the main thing that really strikes you about it is it's very resistant to mindless use. Like if you just have a, a typical tumbler and let's say you're watching TV or browsing the web, you can kind of reach for that tumbler, grab it without even really looking at it, and then bring it to your mouth and take a drink and not worry about any of that. Um, but this is a vessel which you can definitely not use in that way, that you know you really have to kind of be mindful of what you're doing in terms of finding a place that you can hold it uh, without um, poking your fingers in an unpleasant way. And certainly when drinking from it, to find a place that um, you know either isn't sharp or doesn't cause you to dribble what you're drinking all over the place. Uh, oh, in, in this inventory, I guess one thing I forgot to mention also is this um, stroke-like brushwork that's on the exterior uh, that um, gives the, the 
exterior visual appearance, something that's really kind of like feathers or moth wings or maybe the petals of certain kinds of plants. And so, uh, you know, having called out all of those features that are really kind of the most salient features of the piece, both to look at and to use, you know, if you now ask, what are the different kinds of things that it makes you think of? So, you know, this, uh, these, this cluster of black needles hidden in this little nook on the underside of the piece, you know, it th makes you think about if you're tide pulling, sometimes you'll see a sea urchin kind of uh, tucked into a little nook between the rocks. Um, this fact that the interior surface is glossy while the exterior surface is a chalky underglaze, it means that when you put your lips to it, your lower lip um, is against something very chalky and shell-like, whereas your upper lip will come down on something very smooth and glassy. And to me, that really recalled the experience of eating raw oysters. Um, from the brush strokes that I was just mentioning, you know, you have this association with petals or feathers or, or moth wings, maybe. And then, you know, this uh, sharp, this surprising sharpness and pointiness of pieces on the rim. You know, sometimes you might get the idea of it's kind of like if I took a bottle and just um, broke off the top of it rather than opening the bottle and then trying to drink from that. Right, that would be the sort of uh, uh, you know the, the the feeling that you could sometimes have. And so now, um, so these would be the things that um, uh, would be called the, the netifiers. And so now, the the generalized associations that those would invoke, so the parifiers of the metaphor, these would be something I think like thinking of oysters or sea urchins, kind of in their raw or uh, native state, kind of uh, brings up ideas of uh, you know living off the land, so wild sustenance foraging, maybe even, you know, the contingency of foraging, right? That if you're uh, trying to survive by just um, plucking things out of tide pools, you'll have times when you're not able to do that. There'll be other times when you are. Um, you know, drinking out of a broken glass or drinking out of a shell or something like that, you know, it, it reminds you that, well, even if it's not a super convenient or, you know, very finely engineered and tailored um, vessel for the purpose of drinking, it's still something that you can use for drinking. So at least to me, it, it calls up ideas of things like, uh, you know, it's, it's marginally useful. But, you know, in this, uh, this context of thinking about foraging and, and wild sustenance, something that's barely useful is still useful, right? It's something that, can still, that still supports life. And, you know, so overall, there's this kind of image of precarity uh, or mindfulness or, you know, some sort of gratitude, appreciative consumption. And so what those all synthesize into then, this thing that would be the, the parafran in Jane's terminology, would be that you know what this uh, drinking vessel really conjures up is this sort of feeling as you use it of kind of mindful and appreciative consumption of what, whatever it is that you're drinking. And also I think you know, it, it uh, brings you to reflect on the idea of the willing accommodation of dysfunction. Right, that you know, in many ways, this is a, a very inconvenient sort of cup to use but I think, you know, overall, it's such an aesthetically pleasing, it's such a beautiful piece that um, you know, it's still something that you want to use, even if it's something that's difficult to use in some sense. And so um, now, just going into the, the very last part of the talk, what I want to do is play this game again of trying to generalize from this sort of metaphor that emerges from considering an individual uh, pot and seeing in what ways can we broaden that out to try to discover some ideas for the general medium analysis of, of functional ceramics? And, and to do that, um, I'd actually like to uh, transition to talking not just about kind of casual function, if you will, but to talking about formalistic function. And so in the next series of slides, I'm going to show some videos that are taken of a kind of formal uh, tea ceremony preparation uh, and, um, and drinking of tea. So these are um, videos that I took uh, in, in them. You'll see the host is uh, Nancy Hamilton, who is an instructor in the Urasenke uh, tradition of tea and playing the role of guest is uh, Fumiko Arao. And so um, what I did, this was back in 2019 pre-pandemic, but I sort of dropped off three tea balls that I had with Nancy and asked her to just sort of uh, live with these tea balls for a little while. And then we got together with Fumiko and recorded these videos. And so, um, I'm going to first show you a, a video clip that's using um, an Eka to Chawan by Sajiro Tanaka. Uh, then I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then the two other pieces that I'll kind of compare to that, there'll be um, a tea bowl by uh, Ryoji Koye and then uh, one by Don Wright. So here in this first video, um, 
Uh, parts of it are sped up uh, just so that it doesn't take too long. This clip as it is is something like five minutes. And I, I wanted to show the whole thing. It's, it's the core of the preparation and presentation of the tea. Just you know, for some of you in the audience who may not have um, sat and watched this sort of thing uh, all the way through before, I did want to show a continuous segment of, of this kind of um, ceremony, just to give you a feeling for the uh, kind of choreographed and um, formalistic sort of, of nature of the, of, the, of the process. So let's see. So this first part is sped up. And really, what we're going to be looking at is um, uh, an initial uh, process of kind of ritual cleansing of the utensils that are used. Here we're slowing back down to normal speed. And Nancy's going through some uh, parts of the process that are for uh, kind of cleansing of the tea whisk and the tea bowl itself. this wiping of the rim of the tea bowl. And now we're going back to being a little sped up. This is the actual preparation of the of the whisked tea. The whisking is especially impressive at this slight speed up. back to normal speed with the presentation of the tea bowl to the guest. And so note how there's particular attention paid to the orientation of the tea bowl as it's passed. There's again this turning of the tea bowl. So again, emphasizing the importance of the orientation of it. the wiping of the rim by the guest where it was used. Careful observation of the orientation. And there's now a brief period of sort of appreciation of the tea bowl by the guest, perhaps in conversation with the host. I think I'll, I'll move on to the next slide here, though. So um, that video was meant to be kind of a, a baseline presentation of um, how a, a typical uh, tea bowl would be used. Again, that was the Sajiro Tanaka uh, piece. And so now I wanted to kind of move on to um, uh, 
uh, an interesting case to consider. So this is a, a table by um, Ryoji Koye. Uh, so here are some photos of it uh, taken by Nancy, kind of in the ensemble of, of utensils that are used in this uh, formal ceremony. And then uh, in this next photo, sort of a more close-up piece focusing on the tibol itself. Those of you, you who know uh, Koyo's work will recognize that there's this kind of scrawled inscription of his name kind of carved very roughly into the side of the tibol, uh, which I think is, I find it very interesting aesthetically. Um, there's, you know, of course, some concept behind that as well. But functionally, you know, it does uh, give rise to these very jagged edges on the side of the piece, even through an area which has been glazed as in, as in this one here. Looking at the rim of the bowl also, you know, you have quite pronounced fissures and cracks, some of which have rehealed over um, in the glaze firing and others haven't. Um, and, you know, despite the, I mean, I, I, I like those kinds of features in, in, a, in a pot and for purely uh, uh, visual aesthetic purposes, you know, I think they're very nice uh, kind of markers of, of materiality, but, you know, they do raise some functional issues, uh, which will be interesting things for us to consider. So now in this next short video segment, and um, this is really going to be watching, you know, this exact same sequence of operations. I'm now just uh, zooming into the, the part of the process where the uh, tea bowl is being cleaned. Let's just have a look at that. So here the, here's the host taking this special cloth and wiping the rim of the bowl. And in discussing this with Nancy, you know, she mentioned that because of the very rough edges of the markings on the outer part of the bowl and the presence of those fissures in the rim, this is something that the host has to work somewhat hard to accommodate, to not snag the towel on them. And that can be done in a graceful sort of way, just by changing the kind of pressure that's applied on that cloth to not grip the rim so hard uh, and to maybe focus a little bit more on the inner surface rather than the out outer one during wiping. But you know, it's something that um, takes a little bit of attention. So skipping ahead now to the actual presentation of the tea after it's been whisked uh, from, by the host to the guest, uh, we can watch this segment. So you could see there the, the kind of extra negotiation needs to take place between the host and the guest about which side of the table is the front. But you know that all has to be chosen not only by looking at the outside of the bowl and uh, you know what the appearance of the exterior of the bowl is, but with some consideration to when the the guest now uh, picks up and turns the bowl as she's meant to, that she ends up drinking from a part of the rim that doesn't have one of these giant cracks in it. And then after that, of course, there's going to be this little part where the guest is going to wipe the rim after having drank from it. And so um, these are all things that have to actually get kind of navigated around uh, because of these uh, the functional issues that you have with this with this particular tea bowl. And so you know this this bowl, which is very visually appealing, and I think um, uh, aesthetically beautiful to the point where you want to use it despite these uh, issues. It introduces a kind of functional dis-ease at multiple points in the formal tea service. But a host and guest can accommodate these difficulties with grace, preserving the serene and meditative air such a ceremony is meant to have. And this forbearance can maybe contribute something positive in an aesthetic sense, like a bitter note that deepens and enriches the flavor of a cocktail or of a complex sweetness like that of uh, chestnut honey or blackstrap molasses. And, uh, you know, comparing this maybe to the uh, Shingu Guinomi that we discussed a, a few slides back, and this idea of willing accommodation of dysfunction, uh, because uh, you have such a kind of compelling object that you want to use it anyway, you know, we can generalize that uh, to something at the level of um, medium analysis by saying that um, pots can create meaning via functional conformity or nonconformity with expectations for use in social rituals of traditional culture with this very formal setting of the tea ceremony uh, being a very um, structured and, and rich kind of context um, uh, for that kind of, uh, uh, for that kind of uh, meaning. So the um, last tea bowl that I, I wanted to explore in this setting, so this is a, a piece called, called the tea bowl. It's a beautiful wood fire tea bowl by Don Wrights. 
Um, I think you can already see in this image that it's really quite large. Um, the surface is just uh, amazing. The exterior, the interior, the bottom surfaces. Um, but uh, so here's an image of that tea bowl then in the setting of the, of the utensil that are used for the tea ceremony. You can see that it's so large that it's kind of, it's almost as large as the misasashi, as this kind of um, water container in, in the setting. And then uh, things like the whisk for the tea, which is meant to be able to rest naturally against the rim of the tea bowl, this bowl is so large that the whisk actually just kind of falls down into it, which complicates uh, some parts of um, the, the, the kind of choreographed way that the tea is supposed to be prepared. Uh, but here, let's just watch this little clip um, taken from the recording of uh, Nancy and Fumiko using this. You can see that it's difficult to manipulate for its size and weight. So maybe from this giggling that occurs, you kind of get the idea that as beautiful as um, this piece is that Wright's made, it's kind of hyperbolic size actually prevents it from functioning within the regimented structure of formal, formal Japanese tea. And therefore I would say, you know, it doesn't really draw meaning from its relation to that particular context. It's a piece that I guess we have to consider rather as sculpture or at least as a vessel that references but doesn't really participate in the formal tea tradition. So finally, to conclude, I hope that the examples I've discussed here today serve to motivate the idea of an approach to criticism and medium analysis based on treating metaphor as a primary mechanism of meaning creation in functional ceramic art. As mentioned in the introduction, such an approach has a strong theoretical foundation in the thinking of prominent 20th century philosophers such as Suzanne Langer, Nelson Goodman, and Martin Heidegger. And I think it can play nicely with contemporary interpretive frameworks encompassing activist art and socially engaged practice. It offers a strong counterpoint to the precepts of conceptual art, focusing on self-contained material artifacts as the essential ground of aesthetic response. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>